韩国出生，美国成长，他却对中国文化情有独钟。The birthplace of Chushi two days ago. I'm actually studying Chinese now. So for the show us. 气候变化。身为世界银行行长，他怎样看待中国对世界的贡献 ？We would not even be able to talk about or even think about ending poverty in the world if it hadn't been for China. 哈佛教授，常春藤校长，他将如何面对年轻人的热情与困惑？ It was only by continuing to pound my head against the stone wall that eventually things started opening up. This is the Fengyun Conversation, G20 Yangnan Interview Road, being broadcast. Please enjoy. 是风云际会 G 二零杨澜访谈录特别系列节目，这是由浙江卫视和阳光媒体集团联袂打造的。二零一六年的 G 二零峰会在中国杭州举办，它的主题是构建创新、活力、联动、包容的世界经济。我们知道 G 二零峰会呢是一九九九年创立的。它包括了世界十九个主要的发达工业国家和新兴市场国家，再加上欧盟，一共是二十个经济体，成为最有实力、最有影响力的一个世界经济合作论坛。别看只有二十个经济体，但是他们却代表着全球 GDP 的百分之九十、全球贸易的百分之八十和全球人口的百分之七十，可谓是举足轻重、全球瞩目。而说到风云际会呢，我想它不仅是指各国领袖和决策者的聚会，也包括今天在我们的录制的现场，有来自各个经济体的年轻人组成的 G 二零青年团，他们要在这个场合呢，和决策者和各界的精英进行平等的对话和交流，提出他们的问题，也分享他们的主张。再次把掌声送给我们的 G 二零青年团的朋友们，谢谢大家。在 G 二零峰会上，世界银行、国际货币基金组织、世界劳工组织等国际机构呢，也是特邀参会的代表。那今天我们非常荣幸的请到了世界银行的行长金庸先生。Ladies and gentlemen, let me present you the president of the World Bank, Dr. Jin Yong Kim. Welcome. 金庸，韩裔美国人。一九五九年出生于首尔，五岁时随父母移民美国。金庸曾担任哈佛大学医学院系主任，创立公益组织，在海地等国开展医疗救助。二零零九年，金庸出任美国达特茅斯大学的校长，成为美国常春藤大学当中的第一位亚裔校长。他也曾带领世界卫生组织的团队，在全球进行艾滋病防治工作。二零一二年，金庸出任世界银行行长。就职后，他提出了到二零三零年基本消除极端贫困的目标，这是国际社会首次就建设一个没有贫困的世界制定明确的时间表。随着全球不确定因素的增加，这个目标能实现吗？此次参加 G 二零杭州峰会，他有怎样的期待？作为教育家和领导者，今天他又将与 G 二零青年团分享怎样的经验和智慧？What is it that keeps you up at night? Estar en España. Bueno, podemos hablar en español. Esto no me lo esperaba. Yo hablo un poco de español porque estaba trabajando en Perú durante muchos años, por eso hablo un poco de español. Okay. Okay. Wait a second. What did you just say? I I just said that I speak some Spanish. The interesting thing about the World Bank job is that if you look around the world, 
and rank the most difficult problems in the world. Uh, refugees, climate change, all the world's problems, they kind of land on my desk in one way or the other. Uh, so the one thing that you have to learn to do is, is with all these problems that you're thinking about all the time, you have to learn how to sleep. <laughs> And then I guess the next question is from Mr. An, Henry from China. Yeah, good evening, Dr. Kim. I just noticed that you have visited different places related to Zhu Xi in China. I was just wondering uh, why you have this uh, great interest in this grandmaster of Confucianism. The interesting thing is that in China, Korea, and Japan, despite the differences between the three, um, those three countries really see me as Asian. Right? My mother uh, is a Confucian scholar, so she did her PhD dissertation. I was growing up in Iowa. In the, in the, actually, I grew up in Iowa in the town that Xi Jinping, President Xi Jinping visited when he was a younger man. So when I meet with President Xi, we talk about our friends in Muscatine, Iowa, where, where we both uh, spent time. So I was at the birthplace of Chu Xi two days ago, and I sat in front of a camphor tree that he himself had planted 878 years before. And we read one of his poems that said, the continuous search for knowledge is the key to a family's prosperity. Right? Now, I think that if you look at the success stories in Asia, the success stories here in China, it's this intense uh, humility in front of knowledge and the desire to learn that I think has been the absolute key in the development success. Well, Dr. Kim, if you were to have a conversation with Master Zhu Xi, how would you explain to him your job? So uh, he, in, in his entire life, uh, Zhu Xi kept thinking about social justice, about compassion, about love. And so uh, I would say to him uh, that my mission is the same. But in today's world, if you don't have access to capital, if you don't have access to knowledge, if you don't have access to the experience of others who've solved problems, you cannot lift yourself out of poverty. Uh, you continue to fall behind. And so what I do today, uh, I like to think, is similar to what he was trying to do, to bring greater justice to the world. 二十国集团峰会机制诞生，作为全球经济合作的主要论坛，同心协力促进国际金融稳定和经济持续增长，成为G20峰会的目标与追求。除了二十个经济体的领导人，韩冠礼G20还邀请联合国、世界银行、国际
，中国是世界上最大的发展中国家，也一直是世界减贫事业的积极倡导者和有力推动者。在过去三十年里，中国的贫困人口减少了七点九亿，对全球减贫的贡献率超过百分之七十。金庸认为，中国在消除贫困方面是世界上最有经验的国家，在全球减贫领域正发挥领导作用。Actually, before you came in, I was introducing to the audience here about the goal of 2030 by World Bank to relieve extreme poverty and also to boost the shared prosperity. Are you still as confident as two years ago when you set up this goal with so much uncertainty nowadays? So it's still hard to get there, but my goodness, you know, I, I, I say to my, uh, my, my, my teams at the World Bank Group, you know how lucky we all are that every morning we wake up and if our kids say, what are you going to do today? What you say to them is, well, I'm going to go to the World Bank and I'm going to try to end extreme poverty in the world. How, for how fortunate are we that that's the work that we get to do? You know, uh, one of the greatest stories in the world is the fact that we went from 40% plus uh, people living in extreme poverty to less than 10%. China uh, also set the target to relieve the remaining 70 million people out of poverty by 2020. Uh, uh, is there any connection with your goal? Well, it, the, it, we would not even be able to talk about or even think about ending poverty in the world if it hadn't been for China. China's success gives us the hope that it can be done. China has reduced its, its infant mortality, its maternal mortality uh, tremendously in a few decades. So without the achievements of China, we would not even be able to dream of uh, ending extreme poverty. You have also, the World Bank has also provided some diagnosis or some uh, uh, opinions on the urbanization of China. Uh, how do you see that affecting the future development and the growth in this country and poverty relief? When Premier Li Keqiang asked us to do a study on urbanization, and we looked at all the best examples in China, we looked at all the best examples all over the world, and then came together with a plan for how to begin making reforms. China fairly soon will be the first country in the world that will have one billion city dwellers. Now, uh, we, we know that cities are really the most efficient way of providing services to people, the most efficient way of, uh, of really dealing with large populations. Building smart, more livable, more climate-friendly cities is one of the most important tasks. Mm, yeah, that's under reform now, yeah. The thing that's great about working with China is that, you, you know, it's a, it's a rigorous process of going and working with the government to come up with a document that you can both agree with. But then when you do it, once you get there, boom, the government goes forward. One of the greatest success is a, a place called the Loess Plateau near Shanxi in the northwest part of China. There was um, an area that covered four provinces that had been severely uh, degraded because of erosion, um, you know, uh, uh, um, sort of uh, uh, unsustainable labor uh, 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 agricultural practices. And we, we, we struggled with this. We didn't know what to do. And then, and then one of our people literally was sitting on a cliff, turned his back, and he saw that there was one part of this area that was green, that was growing, uh, that, uh, that seemed to um, uh, be thriving while everything around was being eroded. So they looked into the situation, figured out what they were doing that was different, and began applying those methods. They built, um, they, uh, they built terraces to keep the land from moving, and they brought these practices in, and what happened was that area just flourished. So what we learned from the lowest plateau, we're now uh, applying all over Africa uh, right now to help with the problem of the degradation of land. 近年来，叙利亚、利比亚等中东、北非国家战乱不断，导致大规模的难民危机。随着难民潮不断涌入欧洲，给欧洲各国带来了巨大的经济负担。为帮助各方应对这一挑战，世界银行和联合国难民署等机构一起共同筹集资金，以帮助难民重建家园。Uh, the World Bank Group uh, wants to be sure that uh, after the crisis, and we hope it ends soon, and after people start moving back to Syria, that Jordan is better off than it was before. I went to a camp in northern Kenya where there were 250,000 Somalian refugees who've been living there for over 25 years. 
in some of the worst conditions I'd ever seen. There were uh, three generations of camp dwellers where the mother had come, given birth uh, to the daughter, and the daughter herself had a child, right? So we believe that if we can create jobs, opportunity, hope, optimism in their home countries, if we can create that, everyone would rather live in a place where they know the culture, they know the food, they know the language, uh, where you know they have uh, roots that go back sometimes thousands of years. One of the things we're doing is we're trying to build special economic zones in Jordan, which will create jobs for Jordanians, but also for Syrian refugees. Try to give them opportunity in life again. Well, let me tell you a story. I, uh, uh, President uh, Evo Morales from Bolivia, uh, he didn't think much of the World Bank Group um, uh, about three years ago. And I went to Bolivia and I said, I'd like to meet you, right? And he said, okay, I'll meet you, but you have to go to 14,000 feet with me and play soccer. So I said, sure, I'll be happy to go, right? And, uh, and I, you know, he actually forced me to put on little shorts and play soccer with him. I have a picture in my office uh, if you want to see it. The point is, 14,000 feet, the most remote community in a poor country, Bolivia, as we were landing in his helicopter, everyone was taking pictures of us with their smartphones, right? So the point is, everyone in the world now, the poorest people, know how everyone else lives. And of course, they want that same experience. As they see on their smartphones, that's our job at the World Bank Group. Our job is to try to make that possible. I'm actually studying Chinese now. Right? So, <laughs> so show, so the, show us. Qi hu bianhua, right? Uh. And it was only by continuing to pound my head against the stone wall that eventually things started opening up. Zhejiang Wei Shi, Feng Yun Ji Hui, G20, Yang Lan Fang Tan Lu, Zheng Zai Bo Chu, Jing Qing Shou Kan. Thank you very much. Well, I want to open questions again for our young delegates and who want to. Ask the next questions. Uh, my name is Sanjeevan and I'm from India. I have noticed that most of our top graduates from India choose to go and work abroad, for example, in the US or Europe. So my question to you is that, uh, how do you think a developing country like India can tackle such a problem of a brain drain? Uh, there's no simple answer to your question, but let me, let me um, uh, just give you the story of Korea. <clears throat> so, uh, we, my family left Korea in 1964. I was born in 59, and, and so I left when I was five years old. Korea is one of the poorest countries in the world. And there was a brain drain at that time as well, including my parents, right? But then what happened was that as Korea developed, people started going back. And uh, now uh, there, there's, uh, there's much less of a brain drain. It will change, I, and I, I'm, I'm very optimistic about the growth of India. I can kind of endorse your statement by saying that it actually happened in China. You know, when young people are going abroad for education, they do come back more and more often yep. to start up their own company because the market is more mature, opportunities open up, and they even move to second tier, even third tier cities, uh, cities yep. to find opportunities. Right. So that will happen, I think. Nowadays, uh, unemployment of young people in Italy is quite a big problem and the many more of, of my friends are already graduated students and uh, they prefer to go abroad to look for better positions uh, now i'm feeling like i'm losing my friends <laughs> in greece it's it's close to 50 percent yeah, yeah i think the really really important thing is to become a global citizen. I, I don't know what the future economy is gonna hold, but I can tell you for sure, learning other languages is really great. Learning, learning how to adapt to different cultures is really great. Those human skills, they will always be necessary. I'm actually studying Chinese now. Right? So, <laughs> so, show, so the, show us. The concepts are very similar, right? So climate change, in Korean it's qi hu pyeonhua. In China it's qi hu bianhua, right? Uh. I think uh, being a global citizen, speaking multiple languages, but not just languages, understanding the world from the perspective of others. From the early age, Jin Yong has always been working to the world and to the world. Twenty years later, Jin Yong became the World Bank President and the important responsibility of the leader. This has a lot to do with his relationship with the world and political economy. The development of the young people's creativity and creativity 让世界连接成一个地球村
G20 峰会也为各国青年搭建了共同研讨世界经济问题、献计献策的平台。二零一六年七月二十七日，作为 G20 配套活动的二十国集团青年会议在上海召开。会议期间，二十国青年代表围绕消除贫困和共同发展、创新思维和创业实践、绿色生活和可持续发展、社会公正和权利平等。以及伙伴关系和全球经济治理等议题展开对话交流，最终形成会议公报，提交给二零一六年 G 二零筹委会。这是青年一代为全球经济治理贡献的智慧。Okay, now we are open to the last round of questions. Hello, Mr. Kim. Today, education is lagging behind on the grounds of inter- industrial development. So uh, the knowledge we learn in the in the university may not be the things we need after graduation. Absolutely. So uh, it feels like it's a big challenge for us. So what can we learn about education? And could you share with us, like how to prepare for the future? Yeah, great question. I think the one thing, if I were to say the one thing that will serve you best, it's determination, uh, grit, willpower. You cannot、um, reliably and over a long period of time increase your IQ, but you can increase your willpower. It's almost like a muscle. The other thing is to learn how to learn. The future is very uncertain. We're not sure what paths to growth are going to be open to you. You know, the Alibaba model of economic growth may be where everyone goes down because agriculture is going to become much more capital and technology intensive.、Uh, light manufacturing is also going to become much more uh, 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 capital and technology intensive. So the one infrastructure that we know you're definitely going to need is brains.、Mm, can't agree with you more. Now we have、uh, Stephanie from Mexico. What would you tell people, especially young people, when they want to make a change? They really want to make an impact in the world. What would you tell us when we really want to make a change, but we don't have like the tools to actually make a huge impact? It's.、Um, Not at all unusual that you'd feel powerless as a young person, right? So your success in tackling the thing that you really want to tackle is going to be determined partly by your intelligence, but mostly by your willpower, right? So for me, I, I feel like I've been banging my head up against the same problem for a very long time. <laughs> Making an option for the poor. How do we lift people out of poverty? How do we provide health and education? And it was only by continuing to pound my head against the stone wall that eventually things started opening up. You try to make a change, and then you become powerful and influential, not the other way around. If you quit early, you will never have the power to actually make the change. Thank you so Thank much, you. Dr. Kim. I, I just hope that all the head leaders and decision makers and strategy makers will have the same attitude and connectivity with our young people, because you can see what they are asking for and what they are longing for and what the future will be like. Greatest takeaway for me is that when we talk about poverty relief, when we talk about development and growth, actually the fundamental element is about the investment into human capital. Absolutely. And also the wisest decisions for. Us to make is to invest into ourselves, to build up the mindset and skill set to meet the challenges in the future, which is very much uncertain. Thank you so much. Thank you again. Thank you, Yang. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you. 好，感谢大家收看这一期的《风云机会 G20 杨澜访谈录》的特别节目。我相信呢，金庸先生给我们带了一个非常好的信息，那就是无论是各国的领导人也好，各界的精英也好，都应该来倾听年轻人的心声。同时呢，也让我们保持一个开放的头脑和彼此的联系，来迎接这个世界未来的挑战。感谢大家，再见。是国际货币基金组织首位女总裁，二零一六年连任 IMF 总裁，她有何感慨 ？Well, I guess I have much more white hair. Being patient with others, others, but you're very impatient with yourself. 难民潮，恐怖主义，英国脱欧，她如何应对影响世界经济的各种危机 ？What has been the toughest decision you have to make? Is IMF doing something particular? Try to manage the negative effect. 风云际会 G 二零杨澜访谈录，专访国际货币基金组织总裁拉加德，浙江卫视下期播出，敬请收看。